Good morning. Uh, we're here with part one of a two-part lecture that I'm sure you've been waiting all semester for, and that is the Protestant Reformation. All right, some of the causes of the Reformation. Hopefully you know this from all your research already, and hopefully this is just review, but in case it's not. Um, first big cause is the Black Plague. The Black Plague from the late 1300s killed a lot of people, killed a lot of clergymen, killed a lot of priests. And the church had to replace all those people, and they didn't always replace them with the best. You also have that whole church versus state argument that we mentioned with the Crusades. Who had the power? Was it the religious leaders? Was it the kings? Was it the, the people? Was it the priests? And then you have something called the Babylonian Captivity. In 1305, the French king kidnaps the pope and forces the pope to live in a French city called Avignon. And that pope's going to be there from 1305 until 1314. The English and the Germans and even the Italians are going to accuse the pope of being a puppet of the French government, and that's going to cause a lot of trouble. And then uh, you got something called the Great Schism. Uh, there were two popes. There's one pope in the city of Rome, there's one pope in the city of Avignon, and there's the question of who's the real pope. And it's not just like one pope here, one pope there. There was a whole line of popes going on. There was a guy named Gregory the 11th in Rome. There's a guy named Boniface the 9th in Rome after Gregory dies. Then there's a guy named Innocent the 8th in Rome after Boniface dies. And then you got in Avignon a guy named Benedict the 13th, who is replaced by a guy named Alexander the 5th. And then Alexander V is replaced by a guy named John XXIII. Now Benedict the, the um, Benedict the Thirteenth, he doesn't actually quit. He was kind of pushed out. And then suddenly Benedict the Thirteenth says, "No, I'm still pope." So we end up with three different popes in the Catholic Church. Remember, there's only supposed to be one. So there's a real big question: Who's the real pope? Is it going to be? Benedict the Thirteenth. Is it going to be John the Twenty Third, or is it going to be another guy named Gregory the Twelfth? It's a big question. Well, there's going to be a meeting in 1417 called the Council of Constance. Pope Greg the Twelfth, Pope John the Twenty Third, and Pope Clement the Eighth and Pope Benedict the Thirteenth. They've got a bunch of people, and three basically three popes enter. One pope survives. The pope who wins Pope Survivor at the Council of Constance is a guy named Martin the Fifth. Now, if that confused you, don't worry. It confused everybody in the 1400s as well, which is part of why people are like, this church is kind of a joke now. All right, first guy, hopefully you've seen this name in your research, John Wycliffe. He's an Englishman who lived from 1328 to 1384. Uh, John Wycliffe, uh, he's going to become one of the earliest people who says, whoa, 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 something's got to change here. And he's going to urge that the Catholic Church be stripped of all its property. He says, we're a church, we're not a real estate agency. Uh, he's going to want... Uh, the veneration of saints to be done away with. He's going to want pilgrimages to the Holy Land to be done away with. And he's going to say, you know what? The cult of Mary shouldn't exist. And his basis is going to be, um, I can't find any of this stuff in the Christian Bible, so why are we doing it? Uh, he's even going to translate the Bible into English so that the English people can, can see for themselves, look, I don't see any of this stuff. Now, um, Wycliffe originally had support from people, mainly people who wanted to claim the church property as their own, but eventually the peasants of England are going to catch on to what he's saying, and that's when um, Wycliffe becomes an enemy. Uh, there's a peasant revolt in 1381, and the beliefs of John Wycliffe are seen as dangerous, and uh, Wycliffe's followers are known as Lollardies. And um, John Wycliffe dies in 1384. He dies of a stroke. His ideas continue. And by the year 1400, the king, uh, Richard II of 
Britain or England, if you will, is going to make the beliefs of Wycliffe a capital crime. Meaning if you were somebody who believed in Wycliffe's point of view, you could be killed in the year 1400. Now another name I hope that you've seen somewhere is Jean Hus, or you might see it Englishized as John Hus. But uh, Jan Hus, uh, he lives from 1372 to 1415. He's from a place called Bohemia. If you look at a map today, Bohemia is not there anymore, but you will see a place called the Czech Republic. Now, uh, Jan Hus was the personal confessor to Queen Anne of England. Her husband was Richard II. Queen Anne was from Bohemia. And when Richard II made it illegal to be a follower of John Wycliffe, Queen Anne went back home to Bohemia so that her brother could protect her. And John Hus, or Jan Hus, will go with her to Bohemia. And in Bohemia, he's going to criticize the Catholic Church. He's going to believe a lot of the same things that Wycliffe did, such as the church should not have property, there's no such thing as the cult of Mary, etc., etc. And he's going to end up becoming the, the um, antagonist, I'll guess I'll say, behind the Hussite revolt. And that Hussite revolt is going to go from 1420 to 1424. Um, now, Jan Hus is invited to the Council of Constance. The Council of Constance starts in 1414, maybe 1415, and it goes all the way to 1417. Uh, the three popes who were at the Council of Constance, they guarantee Jan Hus his safety. They say, we just want you to come and talk to us, tell us what your point of view is, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, so his guaranteed safety is given by the pope. So Hus goes to the Council of Constance, and as soon as he gets there, he's arrested, he's tried, and he is executed for being a heretic. Uh, so much for that guarantee. So the Hussite revolt is the response to the murder of Jan Hus. Uh, these wealthy Bohemian or these wealthy Czech aristocrats seize the land of the church. Catholic German armies try to put down this revolt and the Bohemians defeat the Catholic armies and they're going to remain non-Catholic all the way up until the 1600s when the Thirty Years' War begins. Now, what were the complaints against the church? Well, there were several of them. One of them is immorality. Uh, celibacy. Catholic priests are not supposed to have sex. They're not supposed to have kids. They're not supposed to live with women. And guess what was happening? There were Catholic priests with children running around. There were Catholic priests who were living with women. And on top of that, there were priests who were openly drinking, openly gambling, and just doing a lot of non-moral things. Now, instead of stopping all of these practices, the Catholic Church would just tax that priest and make the problem go away. Now, there was also clerical ignorance. Uh, it's estimated that after all of the people rehired after the Black Death, only 2% of the clergy knew what was actually going on. Only 2% of the clergy knew the Catholic liturgy, meaning the Catholic beliefs, the Catholic services, the Catholic ideals. Only 2% of the clergy actually knew Latin. So they were, for lack of better words, faking it until they made it. Uh, translating the Bible into common languages showed how little the clergy knew, and the Catholic Church had a really big problem with people pointing out, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. Then there's something called clerical pluralism. A priest would hold multiple offices. A priest would get money for every office they had. And so priests would have a church in Italy, maybe a church in Germany, a, a church in Norway. And guess what? At that time, you couldn't travel from Norway to Italy. So basically, it's just the priest saying, yeah, I am the one in charge of this church and collecting all the money from it. And then possibly the biggest one, indulgences. Um, when I talk about indulgences in class, I always like to uh, emphasize this point, it's basically a get out of hell free card. Um, instead of actually being sorry for whatever you've done, you can just 
by forgiveness. And they would have people who walked around selling these door to door. They were called the Fuggers, F-U-G-G-E-R-S. These people would go around and they would sell these forgivenesses, these indulgences, and the money would all go to the Catholic Church. All the money would go to the Catholic Church except for the 30% that the Fuggers would keep as um, commission. So this was a really big money-making scheme. Um, you could buy forgiveness for something that you've done. You could buy forgiveness for something you're going to do. And you could even buy forgiveness for something that a relative did. So let's say you wake up tomorrow and you say, hmm, I'm going to go rob a bank later. You could buy a forgiveness today for that bank robbery you haven't even done. Or maybe today you kicked your puppy on accident and you feel bad about it. Instead of actually asking for forgiveness, you could buy a piece of paper that says you're forgiven. Or let's say your dear Aunt Sally cut down a, ch a cherry tree in 1860. You could buy forgiveness for your dear Aunt Sally for cutting down that cherry tree. I mean, indulgences were all about money. You don't actually have to be sorry for your sins. You just have to have money. You buy your forgiveness. So enter Martin Luther. Martin Luther is the big name from the Protestant Reformation, but he's definitely not the only one. Martin Luther there, you see, he's going to live from 1483 to 1546. Um, he was originally supposed to be a lawyer. His dad sent him to work to be a lawyer, but um, it, he suffers a terrible storm. There's a lightning strike that almost hits him, and he cries out, "If you basically, dear Lord, if you get me through this, I will become a monk and dedicate my life to you." Well, he lives. He drops out of college. He enters the church, and his dad is really, really angry with him. Well, what he's initially taught is that repentance, meaning uh, forgiveness, does not involve self-inflicted feelings or penances and punishments. But it's a change of heart. But no matter what Martin Luther does, he always feels sinful after he fasts, after he prays, after he does confession. Everything that the Catholic Church said should get rid of his sins, Martin Luther says, you know what, I still feel bad. So he's eventually going to come up with this idea that salvation is a, a belief in Christ, a belief in the Christian God. And he's going to come up with this idea that faith is a gift from God. It cannot be earned. It cannot be bought. And he names this justification by faith alone. You don't have to do any work. You don't have to do any of the church rituals. You just have to believe and you just have to ask for forgiveness. And that's going to become one of the major tenets of the Lutheran church today. So he's really going to kind of upset the Catholic Church because he's going to go against what he's traditionally taught, what the Catholic Church traditionally believes. And he's going to take it even further. On October 31st, 1517, this is one of those dates everybody should know, because whether you're Christian or not, this changes the world. Uh, he's going to nail the 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle. And uh, if you've read the 95 Theses already, you're going to see it's basically a laundry list of things that Martin Luther has a problem with. And he's going to challenge the Pope. He's going to say the Pope doesn't have the power to damn people. The Pope can't grant indulgences. Um, we're all equals in the church. We all take the same rituals, the same rites. And then he's also going to criticize the wealth of the Pope, too. He's going to say the Pope is just this wealthy guy who's using these rules for his own benefit. Well, in response... Luther is going to be declared a heretic by the Catholic Church. He's kicked out of the Catholic Church. Uh, Luther says the Bible is the only sole source of authority. The Bible is the source of Christianity. Uh, the church is going to, slay, is going to say no. Um, the authority for the church is in the Bible. It's in the church elders and the Pope. All three of those together can tell you what to do. It's not just the Bible. Uh, Luther is going to recognize only two sacraments. He's going to say the only two things you have to do are get married 
and be baptized. Because remember, baptism was the sign of being a Christian. Well, in the Catholic Church, there are seven sacraments. There's baptism, there's marriage, there's confirmation where you um, basically reaffirm your vows. There's something called the Eucharist, which is the um, basically a blessed sacrament. Um, trying to think of how to describe this here. Um, basically, you are. Um, You agree to help the sick, help the, the poor, things like that. Um, let's see. There's also confession. There's also penance. And there's also um, holy orders. I think that's all of them. It takes me a minute to remember them. Um, I've only been to a Catholic church a couple times in my life, I'm going to admit. So if I did forget one of those, and you are Catholic, I apologize. I hope I didn't offend you, but um, Catholicism, it's just not, not my thing. Um, some other things that Luther rejects, he says there is no cult of Mary. Um, he's going to say that there's no biblical authority for the cult of Mary. That's something that was made up in the Middle Ages. He's going to say that there's no such thing as relics. Uh, there were like 12 heads of St. John the Baptist floating around Europe at the time, and you can only have one head, and even then there's no guarantee that one head really is St. John the Baptist. So Luther's going to say relics are fake. Um, these are a creation of the Middle Ages. And then he's going to say there's no such thing as purgatory. Purgatory is an invention of the Middle Ages. And the last thing that Luther's going to reject is something called transubstantiation. <clears throat> and in traditional Catholic belief, I don't know if they still do this today or not, but in traditional Catholic belief, it was actually thought that the bread and the wine from communion was converted into the actual blood, the actual flesh of Christ. Where in most Protestant churches who do communion, it's a standing. Like Lutheran churches, you're not actually eating the blood of or you're not actually eating the flesh of Christ, you're eating bread, and that bread represents the flesh of Christ. But in Catholicism, it was thought that it converts somehow to the flesh of Christ. Uh, which, remember, that's why Romans used to think that uh, Christians were cannibals. <coughs> but Luther's going to reject all that, and he's going to say, no, 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 it's not actually blood, it's not actually fresh. Uh, flesh, it's just symbolic. So, what happens? The Pope is going to order the Holy Roman Emperor, a guy named Charles V, to capture Luther. Charles V was actually at a war with the Ottoman Turks at the time. He says, I'll get to Martin Luther when I can get to him. Nothing, nothing's going to happen. And while Charles V is finishing his war with the Ottoman Turks, Martin Luther is hidden and protected by this guy named Frederick III, the Elector of Saxony, who is actually the one who founded the university that Luther was um, was teaching at. And uh, Luther is going to go to the city of Augsburg. You'll see how that's spelled here in a minute. And he's going to be protected at a place called Wartburg Castle. Cool name, Wartburg. And Wartburg Castle still exists today. If you ever go to Germany, you can go visit it. All right, so uh, the political impacts of Luther. Um, yes, there are obviously uh, religious impact, there are real world political impacts too. Um, initially, the idea behind Luther um, was seen as a way of unifying Germany. Uh, they saw this as something uniquely German, and a lot of the German princes, a lot of German kings thought this was going to unify Germany. Well, it ended up having the exact opposite effect. Uh, in 1524, a peasant revolt breaks out, demanding the abolition of serfdom, a reduction in taxes, and the peasants of Germany are going to use the ideas of Martin Luther as their cause. And um, Martin Luther is so shocked by this that he actually asks the rebellion to be crushed. And because of Martin Luther asking the rebellion to be crushed, over 100,000 peasants die because 
the German princes take Martin Luther at his word and go through and hack, slash, and kill all these peasants. Um, the fighting goes all the way until 1555. Uh, there's something called the Peace of Augsburg that happens. And the Peace of Augsburg is going to fracture Germany even more than it already was because each of the German princes are going to get to choose whether they want to be a Lutheran or a Catholic. Those are the only two choices allowed. And whatever your German prince chooses, then all the followers in that principality have to choose as well. So if you choose to be Lutheran and you are the prince of Saxony, all of the Saxons have to be Lutheran. If they're not Lutheran, you kill them. Um, if you are a German king of Bavaria, and as the, the Bavarian king, you choose to be Catholic, all of your followers have to be Catholic as well or face murder. So really what happens is the German princes are going to get more powerful because now they have political power and they have religious power. And unification in Germany doesn't happen for another 350 years. Germany doesn't unify until the 1870s. There are some historians out there that say this piece of Augsburg in 1555 is the biz biggest reason why. All right, there's another person you might have heard of named John Calvin within your research. I'll tell you a little bit about him as well. John Calvin, he is going to live from 1509 to 1564, and he's going to come up with this idea of predestination. And this is a hard one to describe. Uh, I am not somebody who would consider myself Presbyterian, although I've been to a Presbyterian church a couple times. Um, the idea behind predestination is that you are either saved or you are damned before birth. It's believed that all men inherited original sin and are therefore automatically damned. Uh, God saves some people prior to birth because he is a merciful God, not because of anything that the people do. Uh, nothing you do on earth can change your fate. Now this is where things get a little more complicated from what I understand. Uh, it's believed in Calvinist churches that only those who choose to turn to the church, those are the ones who will be saved. Anybody who does not turn to the church, they're the ones that are damned. So you don't come to the church and become a Christian because of your own volition. You come to the church and become Christian because you have pre been predestined to be saved. So if you're a Presbyterian or a Calvinist, I hope I got that right, but that's my understanding of it. And once again, if you are a Presbyterian, I hope you're not offended. Uh, Calvinists, for the most part, they support capitalism and merchants. Uh, John Calvin went after that group of people instead of the poor. And they are still around today. Um, Presbyterians in Scotland and the U.S., those are Calvinists. If you've had American history and you've learned about Puritans in colonial America, those were Calvinists. And then in France, if somehow you've heard of the word Huguenot, those are Calvinists as well. I'm going to cover the English Reformation and the Catholic, uh, the Catholic Reformation in the next PowerPoint. So I'm not forgetting them. I, this is just so much stuff that I have to break it up into two lectures. All right, secret word of the day is museum. So your secret word is museum. Why is the secret word museum? Because you have to do a museum review. Uh, you don't really have much else to do because of social distancing and you know COVID-19, all of that. So make sure you're working on your museum review. Don't wait till the last minute. Go ahead and get it done since you have nothing else. Um, if you've already been to a museum before everything shut down, write about that museum. If you did not get to a museum, remember there are the virtual museums in Blackboard, or you can do one of those historical film critiques. Either one is fine. But once again, secret word is museum. Go ahead and get the museum reviews done. The other thing you have to start working on, and I hope you are continuing to work on this, is the SLO. The final draft is going to be due here in a couple of weeks, and that is 10% of your final grade. So please make sure you do it. For some of you, I've already gotten the, the rough draft comments back. For others, I'll be working on those this week. So continue to work on that little by little. I like to say work smarter, not harder. Don't wait until the last minute to do it. Make sure you've got your footnotes. Make sure you got your citations. Make sure you got your sources, your evidence, everything that will make a good paper, a good strong paper, Prove your argument 
Think about it like a courtroom. You are the prosecutor. You have to prove you paid the guilty. You do that by citing and giving evidence. All right. Until Thursday, that's it. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.